Hello Booktube, Books with Banks back again with another video. Today I'm going to be doing my 2022 end of year wrap up and I'm going to rank everything that I read this year. Uh, and I know saying it's going to be everything uh, it seems like a bit of a daunting task at first, but I'm actually going to break this down into six different categories, uh, all based on the format that I was reading these things in. Uh, or the format uh, that they were originally written in. Uh, so uh, I will say I'm not going to spoil anything I talk about here today. Uh, and please comment down below if you've read any of these or if you're maybe looking forward to reading any of these next year. I'd love to hear everybody else's thoughts on uh, everything I'm going to go through today. Also, uh, if you haven't already, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe. Uh, and without any further ado, we'll start with the, uh, I guess before we get into the sixth category, um, or the sixth kind of ranking list, I'll start just briefly mentioning what I'm currently reading. Uh, and both of these things I should be able to finish up by the end of the year. Uh, so I'm listening to an audiobook. I'm listening to Dune Messiah right now by Frank Herbert. Uh, and that's going very, very well. Uh, so far, I love it. And uh, I'm loving it even more than the first time I read it, like 10 plus years ago. Uh, and so I'm currently listening to that, just a couple hours left on the audiobook. I'm also reading through this first collection of novellas and short stories uh, in Fritz Lieber's Lankmar, uh, Baffert and Grey Mauser uh, series of, uh, yeah, the kind of shorter sword and sorcery type fiction. Uh, I am about 60 or so pages into this. It's only like 150 pages, it's not very big. Uh, but yeah, so I expect to finish both of these things up by the end of the year, but they won't be making any of the ranking lists today. So our sixth category, we're going to start with graphic novels or comics, you know, uh, and I only really read two kind of different graphic novel stories. Uh, the first being Heartstopper, volumes one through four, and the second being um, book one of The Sandman, which collects uh, like the first three, I guess, volumes of how Sandman was um, published for a while there. Uh, so how I would rank this, I would say I like Sandman a little bit more than Heartstopper. Let me talk about them briefly because there are only a few. Uh, in this category. So this is the Heartstopper series uh, by Alice Oseman. Uh, very, very cute uh, romance, high school romance uh, comic book story. And it is a same-sex same couple, but like I think what's so cool about it is that it's not really that much of like a big deal, you know, like these characters are a lot more than just being the token gay characters or the token LGBTQ plus characters uh there's like like there's a, they go through typical rom-com kind of scenarios and it, they just happen to both be guys uh you know so it, it, it's not like that's the big twist or that's the big uh draw of it it's more just how cute and how charming the storytelling is here also i will say uh, when we get to like volumes three and four which were my favorites so far um, this is where uh, some of the themes get a little heavier. Uh, we get into some kind of, maybe not self-harm, but like eating disorder stuff. Um, and it still maintains a lot of its charm from the earlier volumes and a lot of the romance and uh, kind of cute comedy. Uh, however, it does dabble, or Alice Oseman does demonstrate that she is capable of um, really kind of uh, tackling some of this heavier subject matter. Or at least we're starting to see more of that, especially in volume four. Easily my favorite volume of these four. All that said though, Ranking the different graphic novels I read this year, Alice Oseman's Heartstopper is fantastic, but Neil Gaiman's The Sandman is a classic, and I'm so glad that I'm finally started to read it. Uh, I really, really love this. I particularly enjoyed uh, the Midsummer Night's Dream story near the end. I enjoyed a storyline in which um, the Sandman himself is kind of making a friend throughout the centuries with this one guy and seeing him go up and down in various stations of life and checking in, checking in with him at a pub every now and then. Also that uh, Sandman's sister is death. Uh, if he's dreams, then she's death. And uh, they have really interesting conversations, uh, really brilliant um, kind of metaphorical stuff going on in the Sandman and the art is fantastic. Uh, and haunting. Great stuff there. 
Sandman Body Neil Gaiman easily wins my graphic novel category. I'm gonna bend down. I've got a lot of stuff up here. Okay, so then I'm going to talk about plays. I read four plays this year, uh, and most of them being Shakespeare, uh, with one exception, um, but I'm going to rank them. So in fourth place, I'll put the only one I actually don't have a physical copy of, and that's Henry VI, Part One. read this online. Um, great play. I mean, I, I really like Shakespeare, and I enjoy his histories. Um, I'd say maybe I enjoy his histories more than others do. Um, and... Uh, I think the biggest reason why this gets knocked down a little bit is because the language just isn't quite as beautiful and I can't imagine as realistically actors on a stage performing the dialogue on Henry VI Part One as realistically compared to the other plays I read. Um, also, it's kind of like two plays within one. There's a lot of stuff going on with Joan of Arc in France, uh, but then everything going on with the young Henry VI and which houses are going to control him um, back in England. Um, a bit of a Tale of Two Cities type of thing, uh, however not not really playing the difference or the contrast up um, super well. So yeah, I think I'll put Shakespeare's Henry VI Part One in fourth place. Then in third place, I will put Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest. Obviously a classic. Um, all of these plays are Fantastic, you know, so it's weird putting something like by Oscar Wilde in third place on any list um, And you know not higher or you know putting a second from last on any list uh, But yeah, really really charming witty banter um, Just so much fun and I really like this edition um, gave me a lot of um, Other texts surrounding the text of the play itself kind of introducing me to who Oscar Wilde was a little bit more, uh, familiarizing me with the context that this play was released in, its reception then, its reception over the years. All of that helped out really well. Um, however, I do think I just prefer the settings and the uh, writing style of Shakespeare, which happened to be the two entries above this. Uh, I prefer that over Oscar Wilde. I think if I knew there was a Shakespeare play being performed on the same night that an Oscar Wilde one's being performed, I'm probably nine times out of ten gonna go see the Shakespeare one. Uh, so yeah, importance of being earnest, really really good. I highly recommend. It's very very short read. As I mean, you know, most plays are pretty short. Uh, but yeah, it comes in third place for the plays. In second, and I actually have a review of this up on my channel, I have Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, a lot's going on in this play. If maybe you cut out one or two plot lines, sure, maybe it won't be as funny, but it might be a little more straightforward, and maybe he could have done a little more thematically. Um, all that said, those are probably my only real big negatives or knocks against this, why it's not in first place. Um, really, really amazing. I mean, anyone who's seen or read or done an experienced Midsummer Night's Dream knows how charming and how witty and how magical and mystical uh, and how much fun it just seems like all of the characters are having with each other um, throughout the whole course of this. So yeah, Midsummer Night's Dream comes in second place. Then in first place, I have to put King Lear. This was amazing. Uh, I think, I don't know why I slept on this for so long, um, but like with the tragedies, I knew I had always loved like Julius Caesar and Macbeth, and of course I really liked Hamlet, um, but I guess maybe I just never, I hadn't heard as many people talk about King Lear, maybe there hasn't been a very like, or like, um, I don't know, I mean, not a lot of Shakespeare adaptations or blockbusters really, but there hasn't been much talk around any kind of recent adaptations with like a star-studded cast or anything of this, whereas some of those other plays um, get remade or retold maybe a little more frequently. Uh, but yeah, no, reading this and how he dives into madness and um, kind of the parent passing on or kind of being insane at the prospect of passing on his kingdom to his daughters who he's growing more increasingly paranoid about. Um, also, uh, you have another storyline going on between rival brothers um, and one brother who loves the other and the other one who just wants everything that the brother, the other brother has and uh, will stop at nothing to uh, achieve his goals. King Lear is so, so good. I highly recommend anyone read this uh, if you haven't or go see an adaptation of it somewhere uh, in some shape or form. 
really really great stuff easily my favorite play of the of 2022 that i read king lear so that was category five now category four this one's weird um but it's gonna be like my short stories and slash like short story collections thing um so i mentioned in some of my other videos that i've been reading a lot of diana gabaldon uh and uh, because of that uh, Lord John and the Hellfire Club, the first story in this collection of short stories and novellas. Uh, I'll enter that into this category and I'll enter that into its second place because there's only two entries here really, um, but it's last place. Uh, it's fine. Everything else that Diana Gabaldon does with Lord John is just so much better and so much more interesting. Uh, her ex explorations of other facets of 17th or 1700s, um, 18th century society is all just more interesting in other books uh, aside from the first. I mean, it's a very short, like, oh, I don't know. It's like 30 pages or so at the beginning of this. Very short, um, simple story, short, sweet. It's fine, but definitely my least favorite. Uh, but then I'm going to say um, Raphael Bell Blacksburg who wrote, some of you might recognize that name if you're a fan of the Netflix animated uh, show uh, uh, Bojack Horseman. Uh, he was the writer and creator of Bojack Horseman. Um, even says that right there. Um, but he has this collection that came out. I don't know if this came out this year. It came out pretty recently, but it's called Someone Who Will Love You In All Your Damaged Glory. Um, and it is just full of amazing short stories, all a little bit absurdist but like buried under like very real kind of uh, like settings and um dr set dressings maybe uh for example i think my favorite and just this is only helped by the fact that i got engaged this year and so i have a lot of uh i relate a lot to this story um but there's a story called a most blessed and auspicious occasion uh and uh, it's all about the bizarre rituals that different family members want, every, want a newly engaged couple to go through at their wedding and everyone butting in and offering their advice and giving all of these ridiculous, like, oh, of course you have to sacrifice this many goats and of course you have to light this many ritual candles and of course you have to get the giant big golden egg and all of this just like ridiculous stuff, um, kind of just to poke fun at uh, and show how ridiculous some of our actual more real world realistic customs um, when it comes to weddings are and how overwhelming a lot of that can be when you know families start to give you way too much advice uh, so I think maybe all but one or two of the short stories in here I enjoyed reading more than the one um, Diana Gabaldon's short story I read that being said I did read some Diana Gabaldon novellas and we have uh, for my third category, I guess, uh, I'll be talking about the novellas that I read uh, this year. So, you know, just a little bit longer than standard novel. Um, and with the novellas, there are three things that I think are technically considered novellas I read. The first being um, one of the later stories in Diana Gabaldon's Seven Stones to Stand or Fall uh, collection. And yeah, most of what's in here are those longer novella length stories. And um, again, these are all related to her Outlander series uh, with a really good ad adaptation on stars. Uh, I'm really enjoying getting into the books uh, and the TV show. But uh, there's a story in here called A Fugitive Green, and it's kind of about like the secondary characters of her side series, of her Lord John series, and kind of introducing us to some of them and certain elements of like spy life and espionage in high society London in the 17, I guess 1740s or so. Um, so it's it's a fun story. It can, it's a little dry. Um, the humor doesn't all hit like perfectly for me. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think all of those reasons are why I'm gonna put A Fugitive Green in third place out of three for the novellas. Then we return to another Diana Gabaldon collection where uh, the short story that I ranked a little lower uh, was but the second story in here is more novella length, and that is Lord John and the Succubus. I actually really enjoyed this more than Lord John and the Hellfire Club, more than A Fugitive Green, um, at least as far as this side Outlander content goes. I thought this was a really uh, 
a really fun story about you know suspicions during the Seven Years' War. Um, German soldiers are uh, really nervous about rumors of a succubus. German and um, English soldiers really, really nervous about a succubus. Uh, and there's the French there, and there's the mounting tensions of the war, and children go missing, and it's kind of it's pretty dark. Uh, there's murders. Uh, it's very intriguing kind of trying to puzzle together or piece together exactly what's going on. Lord John is kind of just getting fed up with a lot of it. Uh, there's also this kind of underlying romance uh, between Lord John and one of the other characters that I find pretty compelling. So yeah, Lord John and the Succubus easily ranks in the middle of these three novellas. Uh, but then we move on from Diana Gabaldon to a novella by my favorite author, probably working right now today, and that is, of course, none other than Stephen Erickson with his seventh in uh, the Tales of Balcolin and, and Corbel Brooch uh, dark comedy novella series all existing in his Malazan world. Um, this deals with uh, two necromancers, Balcolin and Corbel Brooch, and their manservant, Amansa Poor Reese, uh, going through, you know, a bunch of different cities, pointing out kind of ridiculous things aspects of civilization, uh, but doing so very violently with their necromancy, uh, and uh, it's very, like, grim stuff, uh, but very ridiculous comical stuff, too. Um, this one I really enjoy because Erickson decided to show us what three other necromances are like and what their relationships are like with their respective manservants, um, kind of to give us this nice compare. Con contrast thing between those ones, those bad guys, and Balcon and Carbo Brooch and their relationship with Emancipate Reese. So, uh, which really is the heart of this, of the comedy in these novellas, is that Reese or the, their dynamic with their manservant. Um, it's at least some of my favorite stuff here, and so I liked how uh, this story kind of stressed that type of relationship. Uh, my favorite novella, easily, Upon a Dark of Evil Overlords by Stephen Erickson. Next up, our fifth category, and our last before we get into the uh, bigger 15 book ranking of all 15 novels I read this year. Um, this fifth category is the audiobooks I listen to. So in last place, uh, it's only three audiobooks I listened to this year. Four if you include Dune Messiah that I'm currently listening to, but I didn't include that in the ranking. So in last place of these three is The Perfect Marriage. Listen to this with my fiance. We both did not like it. It did not click with us. A lot of elements of typical murder mystery tropes just aren't handled very well uh, or very believably. Uh, the court proceedings, none of it makes a ton of logical sense why characters are allowed to just go into rooms and an investigation and um, get into places and talk to people that really you'd think that they really shouldn't be allowed to talk to. Um, a lot of weird logical inconsistency stuff like that. Um, and also it relies so heavily on this twist at the end that again I don't want to spoil anything here but the twist is basically like in some way shape or form one of our characters has been lying to us throughout the book um, in the sense that, but to like such a level where it's not just things they've said to other characters, it's their inner monologues and how frustrated they are with not being able to figure out certain elements of the situation. They're lying to themselves, I guess, about, or the author's lying to us, I think, about how frustrated or not frustrated, or half pleased with things this character is. And I find that type of uh, unreliable narration uh, really annoying uh, and really, like, really deceptive and just, I don't, it just sucks all the fun out of a murder mystery because then there's clearly no way that we could play along. Um, there's no kind of work that the author has to do to try and construct a neatly crafted narrative uh, and to construct a mystery because in the end they can just say oh yeah that w wasn't actually how that person felt about the situation it was all just that was all just misdirection 
Um, and it's not even misdirection, it's just lying. I, uh, I just, not a fan. Easily my least favorite thing I read, um, listened to, I guess, this year. Uh, then in second place, I reread, or I listened to, um, and this is a reread, uh, Memories of Ice, book three by Stephen Erickson. Uh, book three um, in Stephen Erickson's Malaysian Book of the Fallen. Uh, really, really great book. Probably my favorite of these three, even though I didn't put it in first, but I'll explain why in a second. Um, yeah, I love any time I can return to this world, uh, and especially uh, the main ten book, Book of the Fallen series. So Memories of Ice, easy second place. Um, in first place, though, I am going to put The First Dune book by Frank Herbert. I listened to this on audiobook, and it was a reread as well, just like Memories of Ice. However, why I think I'm putting this higher is because my love of this story only went up here, where it kind of just stayed the same with Memories of Ice. Uh, but I was 10, 11 years younger when I read Dune the first time, and so a lot of the themes... Um, a lot of the stuff kind of went over my head, uh, and this time I think I was able to absorb a little bit more, and I got into the storytelling a lot more, and I was able to uh, better appreciate um, why Herbert chose to do things like an omniscient uh, point of view, why he chose to center a lot of the storyline through um, the viewpoint of Lady Jessica. Um, I. Yeah, no, I, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. If you haven't read Dune, um, especially if you're like, uh, really like the recent adaptation of the first half of the first book, um, the Denis uh, Villeneuve um, adaptation, then, I, I mean, at, what are you waiting for? Go read Dune, please. Uh, read or listen to it. Uh, it's, this was such a, such a pleasure to enjoy yet again. All right, now the main event, uh, ranking the 15 more proper novels I read that, you know, weren't rereads, weren't audiobooks, weren't uh, novellas or short stories or graphic novels or plays. Uh, these are the 15 more proper novels that I read uh, all for the first time this year. In fifth place, oh, and I will say uh, some of these are in the same series. I'm not going to do like what some other booktubers do uh, where they only like mention one per author, uh, just because I'm going through everything I read. Uh, so, yeah, and, and I also think it helps to convey a sense of which series, like, if you know I've read something this year and I haven't even, if we get to, like, the top five and I still haven't mentioned any of them yet, um, and you're like, well, I guess you must really, really love that series. I want this list, this ranking of uh, these 15 to, you know, properly convey all of that. So, in 15th place, uh, one of the first books I read this year, Karen M. McManus's One of Us is Lying, a decent high school murder mystery um, that relies on breakfast clubby tropes. Uh, it's okay. Um, I think it it's a little too stereotypical of certain high school types of characters uh, and, you know, those types of archetypes. And I don't know, I just, it, nothing with, about this book really stuck with me or... Like, I mean, sure, I remember who who did it and kind of what the twist is and how the situation resolves itself in the end. But it didn't, like, when it happened, I was like, oh, that's sad. But that was it, you know? Like, I I, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I, very um, not impactful storytelling here. Um, I haven't read anything else by McManus. Maybe she's a great author and... Um, I'm sure people might really enjoy this book. Uh, I, from what I understand, it is pretty well liked. Uh, it got an Apple TV, I think, adaptation. Uh, haven't watched that yet. Don't really care to. Uh, again, it's not like I hate anything about it. It just didn't really make me feel any way about anything. Um, yeah, last place, 15th place, one of us is lying. Sorry. Then in 14th place... Um, I read this book, If We Were Villains, by M.L. Rio. Um, again, uh, so One of Us is Lying wasn't fantasy. This isn't fantasy either. You're going to see some that aren't on here because of a book club that I was part of or that I've been a part of. Um, this started out, actually, I was really, really hooked with this because it's basically like a, 
uh, higher education institution that's it's like an arts college um, but like really prestigious and like kind of pretentious place uh, where the theater kids like all the theater program is just Shakespeare um, this actually like why I read some of the Shakespeare stuff was when we started reading this I was like I haven't read Shakespeare in a while. I kind of, along with this, I should go back and read some of those. Maybe that was a mistake because I was finding as I got more and more into reading some of those Shakespeare plays that I've missed, um, I was falling in love again and more deeply just getting drawn into the works of actual Shakespeare. But as I progressed further in this book, I was really getting kind of drawn out of it. Uh, there again with this, there's like a murder mystery sort of thing that's going on. Um, which offers interesting opportunities because I mean you know they're performing Shakespearean tragedies and someone dies in it and you know and there's a lot of kind of comparing how kings and stuff die in certain Shakespeare plays and how main characters die in Shakespeare to how this person died and uh but then there's also this just kind of I thought the mystery of who killed the person was a little bit obvious uh, and all of that really distracts from all the Shakespeare love and kind of references. Uh, and also on that note, for someone like me who actually really enjoys Shakespeare, I en those are my favorite parts of the books when they're doing scenes and when they're constantly talking basically in quotes to each other or having entire conversations just by quoting Shakespeare. I think that's kind of cute and kind of fun. Everyone else I was reading this book in the book club with kind of helped highlight to me how frustrating and how annoying that can be for people who aren't into Shakespeare. Um, and of course that's a matter of taste, but I do think when those are my favorite parts of the book, and for a lot of people those might be the more frustrating and annoying parts, um, I do, I, I really do think I should knock it a few points there. Really, this goes so low because all it made me want to do was read Shakespeare and kind of just move on from anything that was unique about this book itself. The characters themselves don't really, aren't really that much fun to read about, I didn't think. I thought maybe one of them stood out, like the stereotypical, like, hot girl, you know, quote unquote, hot girl. She's kind of interesting. Um, I think she has a few more layers than some of the other characters do uh but her main character i don't even remember his name um the i i don't know it's just not from like how excited i was knowing what the book was about um and how intrigued i was from the premise uh the actual content here just totally disappointed me totally let me down uh, so yeah that comes in a 14th place if we were villains ml rio then in 13th place, uh, now I'd say this is actually the point where we have a break. I'd say all top 13, I actually really enjoyed those first two, One of Us is Lying and If We Were Villains. I don't really feel a strong urge to recommend those to anyone. Like, I, I don't know who they're for, really. I don't know who would really enjoy those. Uh, but this next book, 13th place, again, I read this for that book club. This is The Paris Apartment. It's a, not necessarily a murder mystery, more a missing persons mystery uh, set in Paris. Now it doesn't make Paris look very good. Constant talk about rioting uh, and uh, police officers and getting lost and kind of the slums and stuff. Uh, not a very, very good look for the city. And part of what I was intrigued about by this book at first was, oh cool, we're gonna hit up some Paris landmarks and stuff and kind of get that romantic sense of European city, you know, touristy sort of um, voyeurism. No, n none of that here. Uh, it doesn't make you want to go to Paris at all. Uh, it makes it kind of seem like a pretty awful place. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of intrigue, a lot of mystery. I think the mystery here works a lot better um, than the previous two that I've talked about. Uh, I think the characters, well, none of them are particularly likable. They're almost comically rude and like annoyed with each other and like so frustrated with the meddling of everyone and um I, yeah it, it's interesting so basically the premise is a, a woman uh, a young woman her brother or stepbrother um uh he uh, maybe not stepbrother adopted brother i think um he lived he's a journalist he lives in paris and in the 
the Paris apartment and uh, she's coming to stay with him for a little while. Book opens with him, you know, rushing to write some type of article and then someone comes in his room and he's like, no, wait, don't. And then, you know, cut to black. We don't know what happened there. His sister gets there to spend the, you know, to live with him for a little bit. He's not around. All of the tenants, the like four or five tenants of this apartment are super sketchy and super like suspicious. Like they don't make any real honest efforts to hide how suspicious the whole situation is. So from like right off the bat, she knows something horrible is up. Um, all that said, I think it really is kind of fun. It, it, it's, a, it's a fun, fun missing persons mystery. Uh, the Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. Recommend it to murder slash missing person mystery fans. Next up we have, we go back to Diana Gabaldon. I've mentioned her a few times in this video and I will mention her three more times, uh, but in 12th place I have a short-ish novel that she wrote. This is the first side novel in her trilogy of Lord John novels. Um, a Again, of course, these are side novels to her main Outlander series, Lord John being a character who briefly um, pops up in, I guess, book two, but then he's more properly introduced in book three of that series. And this book, he's investigating a, um, he's investigate, or he, he's suspicious about a man who might have uh, he might have some kind of like STI or something and he doesn't want that man to marry his, I don't know if it's his sister or his um, niece or something like that or someone, his cousin, someone in his family and he's like, ooh, I gotta get to the bottom of if this guy actually contracted some kind of disease. Um, and so it's kind of a funny um, premise, uh, but then he gets all wrapped up in a lot of intrigue and again there's kind of more murder mystery st uh, vibes to this, uh, but it, it is fun. Um, it's, I, I think of all the Lord John stuff I read this year, I might like Lord John and the Succubus, that novella I talked about before, I might like that a little bit more than this, uh, but yeah if the rest of the Lord John stuff is going to be along the lines of that story and this story, I'm, I'll thoroughly enjoy every kind of journey or side um, adventure I have with uh, with this character. Uh, cute book. If you're a fan, I, I definitely recommend this if you're a fan of Outlander uh, and you just want to expand into other things uh, Gabaldon wrote in the same universe with some of your, uh, some of the favorite characters. Uh, yeah, Lord John of the Private Matter easily comes in at 12th place. Next up, in 11th place, Next up in 11th place, again, this is a book that we read for uh, the book club I was a part of. And I think some of the other people in the book club were a little bit more bored with this, didn't like the pacing, uh, the, the premise was a little dry. Um, I actually really, really thought it. It was a very down-to-earth story. Um, this is Louise Erdrich's The Sentence. Uh, it's all about a, um, a member of a... Native American uh, tribe, indigenous community in, I guess they're in North Dakota or Minnesota, they're somewhere up there. And she's, uh, th this woman works at a bookstore and one of, uh, this old lady who always used to come into the bookstore, um, she's just passed away and now um, the main character, um, who kind of has like a bit of a sketchy criminal past. Um, but the, and the main character who now works a pretty, what a lot of people might call, consider a ho-hum life, um, selling books at a uh, used bookstore, or m maybe it's not a used bookstore, but you know, just a smaller local bookstore, um, uh, or small town bookstore. Um, the main character, she starts seeing the ghost of this old patron of theirs um, coming in through the, the shop. And I, I think what I really like is there's never any kind of intent to be like, oh, okay, let's try and prove if ghosts are real. Let's try and get to the bottom of this ghost situation. No, it's just kind of this ghost is coming around and it's upsetting her. And I mean, maybe she's just hearing things, but she believes in spirituality. And because she's the main character, it's kind of taken as, yeah, she's seeing this ghost or she's at least experiencing uh, this stress or this kind of grieving reaction um, for a woman she didn't know super well beyond the patron uh, or the customer um, customer service relationship. Uh, but then there's also some interesting 
mystery elements about that woman's past and why that woman was so interested in Native American history, uh, the old woman uh, who passed away. There's some interesting stuff there. Uh, and also, uh, you can pretty clearly tell that maybe Erdrich was writing a story more about this woman and this bookseller and her uh, seedy past and dealing with like grief. Uh, but then COVID happened um, and because that is very much a big part of the setting of this book, um, not only COVID happening, but there's also stuff about um, George Floyd and um, I'd say and like um, protesting uh, movements and marches and stuff and tear gas and uh, there's there's some really interesting stuff there um, that just provides kind of I guess the back half of the book with a little bit more kind of ramped up speed and uh, relatability because you know we've all lived just lived through a lot of this stuff are still living through a lot of this stuff uh, so yeah not only did the original premise of the book intrigue me with this um, middle-aged woman selling books, seeing a ghost of a patron. Not only was that hooking and captivating to me, uh, but also uh, the setting. Again, it is very kind of straightforward, like realistic kind of, uh, even though there is a ghost, it's not really treated as like a fantasy element. Um, it's just more of a spiritual sort of thing. Um, but a really, really good book. I think the char the main character is drawn really, really well. Um, very believable. Uh, so yeah, if you're into more of uh, this kind of realistic fiction, uh, if you're into uh, fiction about um, Native American uh, stuff and, excuse me, Native American heritage and culture um, fitting in with the modern world, um, there's some really good stuff in this book uh, kind of along those lines. So. Yeah, I'd uh, highly recommend this to, or if any of those are your interests. Uh, probably just gets bumped down to 11th place because it doesn't have, like, you know, some of the fantasy elements that I really love and that I really um, spend most of my time reading. 11th place, The Sentence. In 10th place, I'm going to put N.K. Jemisin's The Fifth Season, the first book in her Broken Earth trilogy. I haven't finished this trilogy, but you'll see further on in the ranking how far I've gotten. Uh, but I thought this book was okay. Um, I, I think, I, I mean, it's very, very creative world that she um, paints here. I think the way that she structures the book is very interesting. Um, I, I think the way she structures the book is very interesting and uh, I, I I just was never jumping from storyline to storyline I was there, there were there wasn't ever really any one story that I was like I couldn't wait to get back to or a set of characters I couldn't wait to get back to maybe there's some stuff in the back half of this uh, this first one here um, where some of our characters are on an island I enjoyed that uh, I thought it kind of gave some of those characters a little time to grow and breathe, uh, where I felt like a lot of the rest of the book, I mean, it, it's so, the, it, Je Jemison does so much really good work showing us how, and not telling us how this world works and how unique this fantasy sci-fi setting she's crafted actually is, that I think things like plot and character uh, fall a little bit to the wayside because she's spending so much of her time uh, or investing so much of the page count into throwing these characters into situations that highlight various aspects of this really brilliant world. Um, so yeah, all of, all of that I think kind of leads to why I'm a little bit more mixed on the first book in the series. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think uh, the main character, she's very, very interesting. Um, and the world is very, very interesting. So I, I had highly recommend uh, this to anyone, especially anyone who's a little tired with um, a lot of the f more familiar stuff in the fantasy genre. This is definitely not familiar. It's very creative, very original, uh, very unique. Uh, but yeah, that's the first book, uh, the fifth season, first book in N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth trilogy. Comes in at 10th place out of what I read this year. In ninth place, uh, this is the last book I'll talk about from the book club that I read this year, and I have a, a review of this up on my channel. Uh, this is The Dead Romantics by Ashley Poston. This would also, if I did a, an award for like most surprising book, this would probably take it as well. Um, unlike The Sentence, which uh, had 
kind of ghost and spirituality in it. It didn't necessarily deal with figuring out exactly what the ghost situation was. I'd say this is much more leaning into ghost kind of um, fantasy stuff because our main character is a ghost writer and she just also happens to be able to talk to ghosts and kind of help them um, with whatever they're sticking around Earth to see or to hope happens. Um, they can come and talk to her and she can maybe help them through some stuff. But, you know, it starts, she's very jaded living in New York. Um, she has to go back to her small hometown uh, for a funeral. And there's a uh, supernatural love story that's going on. Uh, it totally caught me by surprise how much I love this. Like, as much, if not more, than some of my favorite rom-coms of all time. And that's already a genre of, like, films that I... Uh, enjoy. Uh, but yeah, no, this is funny and it's charming and it deals with things like um, estranged family members, kind of. It deals with themes like uh, grieving. Uh, really, really good book. Um, the Dead Romantics by Ashley Poston. I highly recommend it. It's easily the least fantasy book that's ranked this high. Uh, ninth place. Then I just mentioned the first in this trilogy, uh, but in eighth place, I'm going to put um, book two of N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth Trilogy. This is The Obelisk Gate. I thought this book kind of, it was a little more focused and a little more, e a little easier for me to follow what the actual plot was going to be. Like there's kind of a, in the first book, there's a lot of catastrophe going on and a lot of like, okay, well, let's just walk away from um, the trauma and let's just run away from uh, the bad stuff that's happening. This book is, sort of two storylines happening at the same time and watching how uh, in one storyline a mother uh, is working with a community and fitting into a certain community that she's found and uh, watching how she's learning more about her magical abilities. Uh, meanwhile, you have her daughter in a different setting um, learning very much similar things but with a bit of a darker twist uh, and I think a lot of the world building it only gets expanded upon here what Jemison is doing with uh, viewpoint becomes a little clearer in this book uh, what various mysterious as elements introduced in the first book what they are and whose side they're on those things become a little more clear in the second book uh, also i think there's just some really really crazy kind of reveals about how the world works um, that on one hand makes sense but on the other hand make the story even better uh, so yeah i think this is definitely a step up in quality uh, at least in engaging me in the storyline uh, i was already i was buying into the world and i enjoyed the world jemison created with book one but this one got me a little bit more uh, into the world, uh, but also more into the characters and the plot of everything they're actually going through. Uh, so yeah, that comes in in eighth place. The Obelisk Gate, book two in N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth trilogy. And I have not yet read The Stone Sky. I hope to read that sometime soon uh, in the next um, couple of weeks, two or three weeks, hopefully by the end of January. Okay, now in seventh place, this is the only book I read by this author, um, probably one of, if not the most famous currently writing uh, fantasy author out there. Uh, but this is a Brandon Sanderson book, and this is Warbreaker. And I think it's fitting that it's around the middle of my list, uh, because I think that's about how I feel about Brandon Sanderson. Um, I like a lot of things more than him, but he does so much well that it's hard to really put his stuff too low on any list. Uh, I think... This is a book of two halves for me. Uh, one storyline taking place in a, uh, with a sister in a palace, kind of a slave bride uh, to a mystical, terrifying, powerful god king or god emperor. Um, the other storyline, her sister uh, in the city trying to rescue her. Um, and working with the thieves and kind of the lowlifes of the town and uh, learning about the culture in the town. I like the storyline that's happening in the palace um, a lot more than what's happening in the town and the city. Every, all of that seems like it's all constantly hinting at lore aspects that I just don't really care as much about as what's literally happening 
in this story. I don't care that much about what happened thousands of years ago. Um, I just kind of want to, I'm much more intrigued by um, how, what the current gods and what the current uh, god kings and lords that are also basically gods, the nobility that's basically uh, have all of this godlike status. I'm much more interested in what they're doing, their scheming, um, in this kind of palace compound, um, much more so than the, what, what seems pretty standard fantasy fare of like gang of thieves, gang of um, lowlifes kind of getting together to try and break into the palace, try and solve a situation, try and get the populace to rise up, uh, you know, stuff like that. Wasn't so into that. Uh, everything with the gods, the nobles, the lords, um, love that stuff. Uh, easily why this comes in in seventh place. Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson. A great standalone book too. I mean, it is tied into the Cosmere, uh, his greater kind of connected universe, but there's no sequels uh, or at least from what I understand, no even like short story uh, or anything else that takes place in this world. A uh, really good magic system too, all based on color and breaths um, and how many breaths someone has uh, to make the world around them more colorful, uh, things like that. Uh, interesting magic, uh, really outstanding stuff with the gods and nobility and um, kind of theological arguments to uh, Warbreaker. Seventh place, or my seventh favorite book of this year. In sixth place, this is the most recent book I read. I uh, just finished it yesterday, actually, or two days ago. Um, this is my first Terry Pratchett, uh, my first Discworld, and for my first foray into that massive series, I decided to start with Mort. I loved it. I thought this was amazing. Um, I mean, sixth place, maybe just because it's not the most serious book. Um, it's definitely satirical. It's definitely absurd. Um, but the whole premise is um, Death needs an apprentice and he hires this kid who seemingly isn't really good for anything except for asking a lot of questions about the nature of the universe. Um, the kid's name is Mort, which I mean, it was funny because uh, Mort means death. Um, and uh, I, there's just, and I mean, there's just so many kooky, wacky characters in this and so many bizarre, absurd situations. Um, it's, it's hilarious. It probably made me laugh out loud the most of anything I read this year. Uh, really, really great stuff. I can't uh, wait to get into further into uh, Pratchett's Discworld books specifically that have to do with the death character. Uh, yeah, more is an easy sixth place. Then in fifth place, we're going to return yet again to Diana Gabaldon. Uh, and now we're actually talking about uh, the first book um, I'm talking about on this list, the first proper novel in her main Outlander series um, that I'm talking about, not the first one released. This is actually book three, Voyager. Uh, again, fifth place, so nothing to, um, you know, laugh at. It's very, very good. Um, I do think it has some pacing issues, um, I think. There's a little too many convenient things that happens, uh, too many characters that we, or that really come in handy, just happen to turn up in the right place at the right time, even if that right place is like halfway across the world. Uh, and they just happen to be friends with the right people to like help things kind of work out a little more easily to get the characters where they need to be for some scenes that you can tell Gabaldon couldn't wait to get to. Um, all that kind of negative aside, really, really good stuff. She continues to, to do a lot of my favorite things that she's been doing in books one and two so far. Uh, and I can't wait to get into Drums of Autumn book four. Uh, but yeah, Voyager uh, book five, uh, or sorry, book three in Diana Gabaldon's Outlander series ranks fifth of everything I read this year. Then in fourth, uh, right above that, the first book in Diana Gabaldon's Outlander series, just titled Outlander. Um, really, really good stuff. Uh, I'd say the TV show adaptation, if you enjoyed that, that's a very, very faithful adaptation, or season one is of uh, book one here. Uh, I think there's some really, some stuff I really like about the book is how compelling the main character is, which is good because it's first person point of view. And if I didn't enjoy Claire Randall or 
Claire Randall slash Claire Fraser, uh, then uh, I wouldn't like these books as much, but I think Gavaldon's created a really, really great character there. If I was like giving out an award for best character, it would probably go to Claire. Um, um, best character I read this year, at least. Um, yeah, uh, also does this really cool thing where like you sort of have a damsel in distress situation around the middle of the book, but then you still have, or you have a couple damsel in distress situations around uh, the middle of the book. But then you still have like 200 or so pages to go because there is another damsel in distress situation at the end uh, and that sort of has a non-typical role reversal, um, let's just say. And uh, that's really, really fun to read about, I think. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's really emotional, really uh, painful to read some stuff in here. Uh, but I, I think Gabaldon writes it all so well and she brings... Uh, 1700 Scotland totally to life uh, love this book highly recommend any fans of sci-fi romance or time travel romance um, historical fiction any fans of anything like that uh, to give Diana Gavaldon's Outlander a try then in third place we're going to return to Stephen Erickson I already talked about one thing I read by him in the novella section uh, this is the first of two novels I'm talking about of his uh, that I read this year and that is book one in the witness trilogy the god is not willing uh, this book's really really good uh, I cannot wait to see where Mr. Erickson takes this kind of sequel trilogy a sequel to his main 10 uh, Book of the Fallen. This book takes place about 10 years after uh, Book of the Fallen and uh, a lot of the book is about ramifications and things that were kind of left behind and left in um, the, the destructive path of one of our main characters from Book of the Fallen and even though there's a lot of references to that character throughout this book uh, it's more to deal with um, the aftermath and the characters in the aftermath uh, of that destructive uh, kind of fan favorite character actually. Um, so I think it takes a really uh, kind of realistic approach to uh, dealing with um, PTSD and self-harm and uh, a lot of really heavy themes uh, Erickson is able to cover here, but also it's hilarious. Uh, there's a whole squad of Marines who are just, I mean, they are I, I just on a comedic level continue to outdo each other uh, chapter to chapter by chapter. Uh, there's also some really great stuff about friendship in here and kind of an unlikely friendship uh, between a hunter and a... A uh, younger boy who at one point in time that hunter might have tried to enslave but no longer um, really great friendship stuff great comedy uh, great environmental awareness sort of stuff and um, how destructive how no matter what we do with our civilizations uh, the environment can strike back in very very brutal ways uh, really really good book I love Steven Erickson um, easily in my top three uh, but yeah, I, I think right now I'll put Erickson's The Goddess Not Willing uh, as my third favorite thing I read this year. Then in second place, the last Gabaldon thing uh, I'm going to talk about in this list, um, and the second one I read this year, book two in her Outlander series, um, this is Dragonfly and Amber. I really, really like this book. I also like season two of the TV show um, that adapted this one. It's basically a book of two halves, but unlike something like Warbreaker that I ranked lower, I love both halves of this, probably equally just for different reasons. Uh, you basically have half of the story taking place in France, mostly in Paris, uh, and then another half, this second half actually, feels a little bit more like a more direct follow-up and sequel to the first book. Um, returning to a lot of the same characters and settings we had in book one, but the stakes are just higher. Characters have grown a bit more, grown to know each other, or in some cases loathe each other a bit more. Um, and yeah, just higher stakes. I think more interesting settings, uh, especially with the Paris stuff. I really love the whole, oh, every, everything that's going on there. Um, interesting kind of introduction to ideas about motherhood uh, in this book. I mean, a little heartbreaking, but really 
uh, really good stuff there. Uh, also, this is probably the heaviest of the three so far on the idea of, okay, if we're in the past, do we have a response? And we know how horribly certain things turn out. Do we have a responsibility to, as time travelers, do we have a responsibility to try and change things for the better? Can it even be done changing things for the better? Do we have agency? If in us trying to change things for the better, are we only going to make things worse? Or are we going to lead this tragedy to be the tragedy that it is, where if we just left well enough alone, things wouldn't have ever gone wrong, but maybe we were always here in the past. This book probably deals with those kind of more mind-bending time travel. What's the ethical thing to do if you're a time traveler? Um, this book leans most into those themes. Um, also, there's some interesting research stuff uh, with people in the 1960s uh, looking into what happened back in the 1700s. Um, that's all pretty compelling. We get brief introductions to characters that just from the TV show and now book three, I know are going to be more important characters as the series progresses. Uh, really, really amazing book. Easily my favorite Gabaldon uh, thing so far, or Outlander universe world thing I've read so far, book two, Dragonfly and Amber. Then my favorite book of the year, and it still um, has sticky notes sticking all out of it because I'm doing some kind of research with this to um, maybe write something or uh, put together something that sounds a little bit more smart, a little bit uh, more of a well thought out analysis, um, but easily my favorite book of the year is we return to Stephen Erickson, author of Malaz and Book of the Fallen, but this book is book two in his prequel Carcanus trilogy. This is Fall of Light. Um, I love this. I devoured this book, all 1,100 pages of the mass market paperback. I thought it was amazing, beautiful style uh, that he's writing in here. Um, very, very serious. It takes itself very seriously uh, because the content's very serious. It's all about a, a kingdom tearing itself apart um, through civil war. And um, the initial kind of idea is, oh yeah, we want this war hero, this legend that a lot of the people look up to. We want him to marry the empress or the queen, the um, leader of our people. Um, and so you might think, oh, that's, that doesn't seem like it should be too problematic, but there's so much kind of scheming that's going on under, uh, under all of that. Uh, so much scheming with the gods getting involved and applying these very symbolic kind of labels and even like changing people's literal skin tone to show what faction they're on. Uh, stuff like that that's happened in the first book in this trilogy. Um, it, a lot of the symbolic uh, kind of conflict continues in this one. Um, there's also people being called to the banner of a war against death which is just a really, and, and a war against grief and loss uh, and oblivion, and that's just a really kind of powerful thing to read about. Even though I think Erickson does, um, he includes a really kind of comedic storyline there with this polygamous relationship of, th of a, uh, a woman and uh, two kind of younger men that she's traveling with to take her to this war, and then her three husbands, because she's that powerful and um, that... I, I don't know, just good with men, I guess, that uh, she has three husbands, all of her three husbands, all representing, I think, different sort of aspects and different types of masculinity in their own way. They're all chasing after uh, her, trying to stop her from joining this army against death. So that's kind of a funny, but also there's some, it's a funny storyline. There's some serious stuff underneath that. Uh, you also have an army of uh, miners, uh, and, like not children, but like people that worked in the mine, uh, you know, and uh, the, the types of weaponry and kind of mystical, magical weapons uh, that they have to fight with uh, bring up a lot of questions about um, grief and cowardice and running from battle and especially one of the characters in that storyline. But then Erickson throws right into this really kind of serious metaphorical symbolic lap of this um, recently conscripted kind of criminal army. Um, he throws into their laps um, these two people 
uh, two of the funniest characters that Erickson's ever written. Uh, so yeah, just a, a bunch of amazing stuff. Some of my favorite characters I've read about this year. Um, favorite depictions of battle, uh, kind of atypical depictions of battle and conflict. Uh, really, really great stuff. Steven Erickson's Fall of Light, book two in his Carcanus prequel trilogy to his uh, ten book, um, The Last Book of the Fallen. Fall of Light, my favorite book of 2022. All that said, whew, that was a, a bit of a longer video. Uh, sorry if that went on or if I kind of rambled a bit about some of those a little more than others, uh, but I really enjoyed this year in reading and I look forward to 2023 even more. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you haven't already, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe and maybe even recommend my videos, my content to some of your friends. Uh, thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye.